hypershade is like kind of where you do most of procedural texturing. Um, so I'm actually just going to save a new file really quick. Um, Um, all right, so I'm just going to go through really quick and just assign this. Uh, blah, Lambert one, uh, and I'm just going to delete all of my textures. Um, so I'm just going to go into my hypershade really quick and basically just reset my scene. I mostly just wanted my shader ball and my lights set up. Um, so if you guys, I mentioned this before, but if you guys ever want to delete extra textures from your scene, you can go to Edit Delete Unused Nodes. It's going to get rid of all of the textures that are not assigned to an object. Um, super dangerous if you're not paying attention, but um, if you are, it's not a huge issue. Um, so basically what I'm going to do really quick is just go through and make two sort of arbitrary materials. Um, I'm kind of feeling like a banana yellow would be a satisfying color for the demo today. Um, uh, is this my... Uh, I should add a new shader ball in here, shouldn't I? Um, Alright, so I'm just going to name this banana yellow uh, and I'm just gonna grab like a random plastic preset because I'm not feeling fancy and I don't like making stuff on my own or a balloon preset that works too um, sorry. all right so you can see apparently for balloons they use a uh, specular color that is also like similar to the uh, base color um, I'm also gonna remap in my HDR quite quickly Doo -doo -doo. This is why it's good to actually include everything in your folder, because I didn't do that and I still have the stuff down. Alright. Um, Alright, so again, I'm just gonna go through and like make a few sort of random textures here. Looks so much better. Um, and so basically the first thing I'm gonna show you guys is like maybe how to make some kind of like scratch paint effect. Um, so I'm gonna pick a new thing. Anyone have preference for like the type of metal that's gonna be under this awkward little paint thing? Alright. Uh, in that case, I might. I'm gonna see what happens if I do chrome and make it like a dark, dark color, rougher and darker. I don't know. It's gonna be some kind of weird futuristic banana. It's gonna be amazing. Um. Oh, actually, in case you guys weren't aware, uh, the Arnold render view. If you click on this little button here, it's gonna render only what you have selected. So, like in this case, it's only gonna render this little square here. So I like. It's kind of nice for doing procedural texturing, uh, so I'm going to leave it on for now. Um, but anywho, so I'm going to go into my hypershade and say... Um, and basically I'm envisioning something for this where maybe it's like a, a sort of dark gunmetal gray with yellow paint on it that's been sort of chipping off. Um, so again, just some more basic stuff, because I think I've only gone over this sort of top part of the, the hypershade with you. Um, so this down here is the node editor, and this is mostly what we're going to be using to um, actually create these procedural textures. Um, so there's a few buttons, I guess, to be aware of. These are really the only ones that I use frequently, but um, these buttons here are going to, like if you click on this, um, this is going to map your, your textures for you and like, expand all of the nodes that are connected to it that are making up that texture. Um, and then these buttons here um, is basically for organizing your node editor. So this is going to get rid of all of the nodes uh, and just be like, I have too much stuff here, I want none of it, moving on to something else, they're all gone. Um, if I wanted my gunmetal texture down here, I could click on that and then just hit this little plus button and it's going to uh, throw it in here. I could expand that if I wanted to, it's going to show me the surf shader, all that other stuff. Um, and then if I decided that maybe I didn't want one of these in here, like I was done with my gunmetal, uh, I could just grab this and hit the little minus button. Uh, that's just going to remove it from this view here. Um, it is important to hit the minus button and don't, if you hit delete, it will literally delete your texture. Like if I click this little display down here and I delete it, you can see my texture is gone, so don't do that. Um, unless you want your texture gone. Um, but that's pretty much the, I guess, the basics of like how to keep this organized. Um, you can, if you need to drag these around, you can just click on them and move them wherever you want. Um, they have these little hamburger menus here that'll let you um, expand or not expand these. Uh, you can also toggle between the expanded versions with uh, 1, 2, 3, and 4 on your keyboard. Um, basically, that'll just expand it. I never do that. I literally just click the little hamburger. 
Um, and then if you need to uh, like actually navigate in here, um, scroll wheel works, uh, unless you have a terrible mouse. Um, and then to move around, you just sort of alt, middle mouse button drag the same way that you do in uh, the rest of Maya to navigate. So are there any questions on how to get around in here? All right. Um, so to actually create the first procedural texture, uh, we're going to make what is called an AI mix node. Um, so if I, if I press, if with my cursor anywhere in here, if I just press tab, it'll bring up this little search bar. Uh, and I can just type in mix. Uh, and you can see it, it basically searches through all of the available nodes and is like, cool, we found this AI mix shader. So if you click on that, it'll create the shader. Um, in this sh Amazing. God, I hate Maya. I don't know what it was. I was like fiddling with procedural texturing in Arnold yesterday and it was just crashing Maya like every five seconds. Um, which incidentally might not be a horrible thing to be aware of when doing this assignment. Uh, I have literally never had that many problems before, but it was like being really, really annoying. Um, so like save often and version often. Um, hopefully it pulled my, it pulled my file. That'd be exciting. Give it a sec. It has saved me something. That's exciting. All right, what am I left with now? All right, um, so here's my, my goofy render going again, and oh, cool, apparently it saved my mix shader too. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna take my mix shader. Um, so you'll look at this, um, and you'll notice that it has basically two input options. Um, so there's shader one and shader two, and this is, think of these as layers in Photoshop with different colors on them. Um, basically what you're gonna do is input um, the, the yellow and the metal color into each of these channels, and then you're gonna add in a separate map to be able to mix these together. Uh, so if I middle mouse button drag the yellow and the gun metal into these options, or into shader one and shader two. Um, notice again, I'm dragging that onto the, the text and not the little box. For some reason the box doesn't work. Um, if I go in and I'm just gonna middle mouse button drag, if you middle mouse button drag your texture over your object and then release, it's gonna apply that texture to your object. Um, and you'll notice that it's turned my weird little shader ball, uh, my banana yellow color. And then if I play with the mix weight, it's going to toggle, so like zero is gonna be on shader one, which is the gun metal, and one is gonna be banana yellow. Uh, so if I get, like go in between those, you can see it's sort of uh, switching back and forth between the two colors. Um, and this is again basically the, the basic premise we're going to be using to texture this thing. So if I, um, I'm just going to throw in for example's sake a checker texture onto this glorious texture ball. Um, and you can see that uh, once I put a map onto the, the mix here, the mix weight, um, it's basically switching between my two different textures. Um, does this make sense so far? Cool. Um, I might actually, really quick, I do have a uv shader ball and it's bothering me that it's not UV'd, so. Um, and you should, before you're doing procedural texturing, um, you should really still UV your objects. Um, especially, because you, you can still use texture maps and such for, um, in procedural texturing, so it does make sense to like just UV the thing and be done with it. Um, so I'm just going to drag my mix shader back on that, and what have we done? What have we done? What have we actually done? Oh, I have a phantom mix shader. Weird. Um, all right. So here's my mix shader. Apparently there was a UV one. All right. Um, so anywho. So I'm just going to break the mix weight of this. Um, I will actually, I want to show you guys something really, so here's an example. Node editor gets really gross really fast. Um, and when you're doing procedural texturing, I would highly, highly, highly um, uh, recommend actually naming your shaders as you go. Because for a single texture, like I was playing around and I had like seven different nodes for things for one texture. And if you don't label them and they're all like AI standard surface, one, two, three, you are going to drive yourself nuts. Um, so label these as you go, like this one, I don't even know what this is, why that's there. Um, what? Ah. Weird, 
Okay. Um, so one thing I'm going to show you guys really quick, uh, just because it's kind of funny. Um, have you guys ever seen, like, Damascus Steel or... Oh, I'm just going to do Damascus Steel. Yeah. Um, there's a similar technique in polymer clay. I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but... Um, so it's, like, something like this. Um, super cool looking, in my opinion. Um, but you can actually do something kind of similar uh, with a ramp shader, which I just want to show you guys really quick, because I think it... Really? God dang it. <laughs> Start over again. Um, uh, once I reopen Maya again, um, you can do a fun thing with a ramp shader um, where if you if you set it to be like two different colors or whatever, turn the um, interpolation down. Yes, uh, turn the interpolation down to zero or uh, so it's or none, so it's just a hard line between your colors. Um, you can make really trippy textures. Like it's kind of fantastic not fantastic is how long it takes Maya to open. Um, it got, oh. One day I'm going to figure out how to make clever quips about Maya freezing and it's just not, not a thing today. Anywho, um, what do I have left? Fantastic. All right, so you can see, um, so here's my shader. Uh, if I expand this, so this will expand only the stuff connected into the shader. Um, this will do anything that uh, the shader is outputting to. Uh, this will do both. Um, so you can see right now I have two things plugged in. I have both of my shaders, and that's pretty much it. Um, so if I go in, and I'm going to, for my mix weight, I'm just going to throw in a uh, standard ramp texture, one of these dudes. Um, and so this is this is where stuff gets real weird. So if I take this guy, set interpolation to none, and I'm just going to do the same thing here. Um, if you go down to noise, if you look at the texture pattern up here, you can see it's getting like crazy wiggly and ridiculous looking. Um, hello. Um, so it's a really fun thing to play with. And if you wanted to, you could make these like weird colors, like blue, and everything just gets like super crazy. Um, play with noise frequency and like just makes it kind of smaller. Um, what is that? There we go. Um, all right. So if I go in to my own render view, um, so I should have plugged that into my mix shader uh, already. Um, you can see that like this is now the mix it's giving me, um, which tells me I might have actually plugged that into the wrong place. But um, it's just like super trippy. If I um, I'll make this a little bit uh, more repeating, but like such a ridiculous texture. Um, Oh, oh, that's why. Okay, so this is this is the beauty of the um, this little thing here, um, which will render only what you're clicking on. So if I have my stuff here, so right now I clicked on my mix. If I click on gunmetal, it's going to show me the gunmetal texture. Click on the yellow, it's going to show me yellow. The ramp, it's showing me the ramp. So that's why it was showing up black and white. I'm like, I totally plugged that in. Um, it can be a handy tool in doing procedural texturing, but. Um, anywho, so you can see I have this like really weird mix of my two colors now, um, just by mapping in different random things to that map. Um, so that's pretty much the mix shader. Any questions about this before I move on? All right, because we're going to be using it a whole heck of a lot. Um, so this is where stuff gets like actually really weird. Um, I'm going to clean this up, make a new mix node, mix shader. Um, so there's other stuff that you can do. So, um, so if I wanted to maybe create the effect that this was like a painted ball, which had it was maybe like thumped around in a case, like treated generally poorly, and there was like some textures or whatnot coming off of the side, or like some of the paint was chipping off of the edges, um, you can also do that with procedural texturing. Um, so. Uh, basically, I'm going to hit tab again. It's going to bring my little search thing, and I'm going to type in curvature. Uh, and I want this AI curvature node here. Uh, so I'm going to take this out color and just keep going. Um, I'm going to take, so I tried to drag out color onto mix, and it grayed it out. Um, basically, mix just wants either a single R, G, or B value. Uh, in this case, it doesn't really matter because it's a black and white image. They're all going to be the same. So pick either our out color R, G, or B, and just throw it in. Again, really doesn't matter which. Um, if 
but you can see um, that as soon as I've done that, um, it has these. Uh, this is basically what the map is doing. It's it's calculating the curvature of the object or like the faces. Um, so anywhere that it's there's like a 90 degree angle or like a sharp turn, uh, it's basically highlighting that with white. Um, and that's going to be used as the map for the object. So when I actually look at the mix shader itself, you can see that I have these little bits of like yellow paint sort of chipped off around the outside. Um, this is telling me incidentally that I accidentally plugged my colors in wrong. So I'm just going to drag gunmetal down into shader two and banana yellow into shader one. Um, I do this all, I literally can never keep track of which ones go where, so I usually just plug it in and hope that it works. Um, so there's like some samples and stuff that you can play with down here. So usually I'll isolate the, I kind of like looking at just the curvature because it helps me like visually see, you know, what, what, what I'm doing is like how it's affecting the, the map. Um, so you can play with stuff like radius, um, spread, et cetera, to achieve different effects. You can see by doing that, it makes this a lot harsher and like this area in here is like not really showing up at all. Um, play with bias and play with a bunch of stuff. Um, the other thing that you can do so that doing that, um, you can see that it popped up a little bit more. You can see that kind of like roughened uh, look around the edges a bit more. Um, one other thing that you can do if you're not quite getting the control you need with the AI curvature node is add in a range node. Uh, so I'm just going to tab, hit range, find AI range. Um, so pretty much anything you're using for the for the Arnold texturing, uh, it's going to have a little AI in front of it. Um, Redshift stuff usually has like RS whatever in front of it. Um, and then anything you see that doesn't have like AI or RS in front of it is usually just something like some random thing that is generic in Maya um, that's going to be able to be used by Redshift or Arnold. Uh, if you're rendering in Redshift and you use like an Arnold AI, you know, curvature node, it's not going to know what to do with that because it's a completely different rendering engine. Um, anywho, so basically, um, what an AI range does, think of it a little bit like a levels thing in Photoshop. Um, but I'm just going to drag this out color R. Okay, I'm going to drag my out color and just put the whole thing into input. And I'm going to grab the out color R from this and drag it back into my mix node. Um, and you can see it's not really doing anything right now um, because I haven't modified the range slider. Uh, so as soon as I start modifying this, um, you can see that you know the input, if I look like fiddle with all these different values, it's going to create really different effects. Um, to, be on to be honest, I find this thing really, really counterintuitive, so I just twiddle with sliders like a crazy person until I get to something that I don't hate. Um, and then I might go back here and like maybe I'll increase the radius a little bit, kind of see what that does in my final render. Hello. Um, but you can see that now I have kind of worn edges on this uh, weird little shader ball. So like especially, it's really obvious on like 90 degree corners, um, and then a little bit obvious down here in like sort of areas of deep uh, where I like poked out holes. Um, so that's usually how to add wear around the edges. Any questions of that? Um, so there's a way that you can go in if you wanted to. So um, you can go in and add a uh, noise texture into this to, to maybe help break up some of the, let's scroll away more, I'm so far away. Um, oh, that's very sampley. Um, hang on. Thank you. All right, that's kind of less hideous. Um, so you can actually go in if you want to um, and add in like some additional noise maps in here to help break up that edge a little bit uh, in case you find it to be a little bit too harsh. Um, all right, Wahaha. I'm just, I'm trying to get like a little bit of a harder line so it's gonna be more obvious when I start adding noise into this that it's like actually breaking up the edge. Um, all right, so you can see that's like pretty hard. Um, so what I'm going to do is basically just go into here, um, and I'm going to just, again, hit tab, noise. Um, and then if I'm looking for like a noise texture I'm, uh, or like a ramp, uh, ramp texture, checker texture, um, usually the stuff I use to map stuff are like the texture version in the outliner if you're ever looking for stuff. Um, uh, but this is just like brought up a little noise node in here. Uh, and I'm just going to throw this into... Uh, actually, I'm going to use this as my mix temporarily. Uh, so I'm going to grab out color or out color R and just throw that into my mix node. 
Uh, and you can see, and I'm just doing this to get a little bit better idea of um, how this texture is applied overall to my, to my shader ball. Um, it is a fun way to make sort of, you know, dirt or grime. Uh, and actually, if you guys were ever wanting to, uh, really quick, stupid fun demo, I guess. Uh, nope, wrong one. Where is it? Threshold? All right. So you can actually do a really weird thing. So like if I uh, set a key on threshold and amplitude, and then I'll just go to like five and set this all the way down, um, and then I'll set another key. So you can actually animate your textures by doing this. Um, so like here's frame five. If I scrub back to frame one, you can see that it's sort of fading uh, between those textures. If I added more frames, it'd be a little bit more obvious. But if you ever needed to, you know, make something disappear or something like that, you can actually key your procedural textures, should you need to. Um, in this case, I do not want this at all. Um, so I'm just going to grab this, and I'm just—I think maybe this noise texture would make a little bit more sense if it were a bit finer. So I'm just going to like repeat this maybe ten times. See what that does. All right. So that's like kind of speckly and grimy and gross feeling, I suppose. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this range. So I know this is like pretty much the, uh, this is like the placement that I was happy with for the grime on the edges. Uh, and I'm going to add in a AI multiply node. Eh, mult, multiply. Um, and this is basically, it actually is pretty much just like a uh, multiply, setting a layer to be multiply in Photoshop. It's going to, if you have like a black value, it's going to multiply it down to black. Um, and any white values are going to be pretty much left alone. Um, so what I'm going to do is just throw out color and input one, and uh, take my noise texture and put that in input two. Um, so theoretically, what this should do, if I didn't put them in backwards, which I might have, um, is that should go in and like break up my noise texture a little bit. Uh, and you can see it's a little bit grainy. Um, but you can see that there are little areas that are sort of like chipped out of this uh, of this texture in here um, as compared to yeah so like if I look at this multiply node you can see this like little nub here has been just sort of like chipped out there's like little bits here that are uh, not showing up because of that noise texture I added um, if I yeah, what was it? if I took the th threshold down and grayed out this more um, it should you know go back and eat away at this a little bit more um, but it can be a nice way to go back in and add some like subtle little scratches into this. Um, right, where was my... See, Redshift is nice because you can control this with a ramp shader, which I personally find much more intuitive, but um, you can use that as a way to go back and sort of like chip out if you want it to be a little bit more of an irregular edge. Um, which again just helps to give it a little bit more of like an organic natural feel. Uh, compared to just having it be a perfect ring of chipped paint around the edge. Um, so any questions on any of the stuff that I've done so far? All right. Um, ah, where's my thing? All right. Um, so there's another thing that you can do. Um, so I'm going to, once again, just set up another, actually, I'm going to save this file like a real person. I'm going to clear this out, set up another mix shader. Um, like I said, mix shaders are kind of just going to be like your best friend for this. It's a little awful. Um, so I'm going to throw uh, banana yellow into shader one. Um, and this is like going to be a demo if you actually want to add something like uh, rust or something to this. Um, so I'm just going to assign a new standard surface shader and call this rust. And I have no idea what rust looks like. There's no helpful presets for this. All right. I'm just going to make this a gross red color and turn down the shininess. Because this feels like a solid rust, right? This looks terrible. Um, all right, so I'm just going to say that this is my rust texture. Um, it'll at least contrast nicely with my uh, yellow. Um, so what I'm going to do, actually, I'm going to really quick reassign this. So there's one more thing uh, I forgot to mention you can do. So what I'm about to show you, you can do kind of two different ways. Um, so if I, I have this mix shader here. Um, where did I, I have this mix shader here. Um, so this is the, again, the thing for the scratches. Um, and you can actually do a thing. So if I grab this curvature node 
Um, you'll notice that the output is, sorry, we don't have a slide. Um, there's two different versions of output, um, concave, convex, and both. Um, basically, they're going to grab either like the outer edges that are sort of sticking out of the model, or they're going to grab stuff that's facing into the model. So I'm just going to set this to concave. Um, and you'll notice that when I do that, instead of grabbing the outer edges, it's looking at um, the, I guess, inner edges of the object. I'm not really sure a better way to describe that, but uh, you can see the difference. So this is like grabbing, again, any like outer corner, um, and this is inner corners. And then if I wanted both, select both. Oh, that's fantastic. Gives you a trippy Christmas version here. Um, but anywho, so if I render this, um, uh, you can see that that's sort of adding the, the chrome in this really deep crevice I added here, and then also a little bit like in the uh, bottom of this down here. Um, in this case, I did not design the shader to be set up like that, so I'm just going to set that back to convex. Um, but that, if you, you could use conva concave with the curvature node to um, hit a lot of like really fine areas in your mesh if you needed to add like a tiny, tiny bit of like grime or like crud that was just sort of stuck in there that you can't get out. Um, so two different uses for the AI curvature node uh, there. Uh, and then this mix shader 9, I'm just going to throw in here. I'm going to rename this because mix shader 9 makes me sad. Um, and let's do this one more game now. Rust. All right, so I'm going to oops, I'm going to call this mix rust. Um, I like to label my, label my mix nodes as mix nodes just so I know they're not like a standalone shader, if that makes sense. Um, but I'm going to grab this, and then I have this disgusting rust texture. I'm just going to throw that in here. Um, so basically what I'm shooting for on this, if you've ever seen like a brick wall or something with a pipe sticking out of it or water drains out, there's like those gross drips or something under it. Um, basically I'm hoping to create a little bit of rust anywhere that's like underneath or like on the underside of this model or like in areas that are close to each other uh, that might not get a lot of wear from other things touching them. Um, so again, I could use the AI curvature node for this. Um, if I used the AI uh, ambient occlusion node. So I might have mentioned this um, for rendering just ambient occlusion passes. Um, basically what it does is it calculates, I don't think you that. There we go. Um, it basically calculates how close areas of geometry are to each other. Um, so I'll turn this off really quick. Um, for grins, I'll put that on the base. Um, so you can see like right down here uh, where the little shader ball meets the ground, it has like a little bit of a shadow. Um, it has some shadow in here because this is like a pretty small tight area. And then in here it's like pretty much black because it's a very aggressive little curve that I added in there. Um, so this is really good if you're actually ever rendering like render passes of stuff. Um, you can just go in and like render out a layer of these. They render like crazy, crazy fast. Um, and they really do help your renders look more realistic. Um, and a little bit nicer. Um, so you can, again, same way you do pretty much everything else. Um, you can adjust like the, the fall off, uh, spread, near clip, far clip, all of this stuff. Um, pretty much just like fiddle with it until you get something that you like. Um, and you can use this, again, to sort of drive the, the rust texture on your mix node. Um, so I'm just going to move this stupid shader here. Uh, throw on mix rust. Uh, and this is my little one. Um, all right, so I'm going to go back to doing the render and loader thing. Um, so if I take this mix nude and I throw this um, out color R onto my mix, um, you can see that it's, uh, once again, I've applied the colors backwards. Um, but you can see that it's basically um, wherever there's like more ambient occlusion, it's sort of, it's putting the yellow texture on, which again, I meant to be the rust texture, so I'm just going to run back and if at first you don't succeed, reapply your textures to the other channel. Um, and you can see, it's a little bit harder to see this way actually, um, but like down here there's like ever so slight uh, tint of rust. Um, so you can push that again further with a range slider. Um, in case you're seeing a pattern by now. Um, so again, I'm just going to throw my out color of my ambient inclusion into the input of my range, and the out color R of my range into my mix shader. Um, so then once I start pushing uh, the input and output max of my min, uh, or what am I saying? Once I start like fiddling with the, f uh, the values on my range slider, I can really like push uh, where that rust shows up. Um, so I mean, this is like 
pretty aggressive, but um, you know, I can keep I can keep playing with this and keep sort of refining uh, where exactly that is going to show up. So like, it, you know, the min is gonna kind of take away some of that rust. But um, if you if you refine this enough, you can get like a little like a really nice sort of uh, layer of rust on the underside of your object. Um, or you can just do something like really aggressive like this, where you really just like punch out the bottom of this and make it like crazy aggressive um, and like super rusty. Um, so that's pretty much the ambient occlusion node. Um, again, I find it like a little bit awkward to control with range sliders, but it doesn't seem like ramp sliders work in Arnold, which is upsetting. Um, so I did mention this is like kind of looking super hideous. Uh, so I do just have some generic textures that I pulled off of textures.com this morning. Um, just like went into texture map, so I'm like here's literally just whatever they think is like a good texture for rust. Uh, so I'm just going to plug this in real quick and hopefully it makes my rust looks less trash. Um, so here's rust, I'm just going to, no that's not, uh, I wish that worked, alright, a girl can dream. Um, <coughs> Alright, so I'm just going to go through and really quickly find those uh, rust textures that I made. And of course, it kicked me out of my. Uh, there we go. Rust. Alright. Albedo. Alright, so that's. What? Oh. I don't see what that's called. Um, Alright, so again, I'm just going to refine this. So. This is like a, an example of you can have like whatever you can have your base shaders look like whatever you want. So, for procedural texturing, it is kind of a valid approach. Just grab a random texture from you know online or wherever, and then go in and just kind of plug it into a shader. And then based on the the modifications that you make um, to like your curvature nodes and stuff like that, it's going to show up um, much differently. And alpha is luminance. And you can see this already has like a much less horrific look to it than whatever I had before, um, just because of that roughness map. Um, so I'm going to go down real quick, and I think, is there a normal map I had? Um, oh, sorry. All right, and then I'm just going to throw the bump map on here and call it a day. Um, so they've actually included, textures.com usually uh, does normal maps. So um, previously, I've mostly just been working with bump maps. Uh, if you do want to switch it to a normal map, just take this use as bump and set it to tangent space normals. Uh, and that's going to basically tell it to use a different calculation when looking at the map, and it's going to render it, or it's going to render your normal map as a normal map instead of a bump map. Because um, usually it'll actually cause errors with the, oh god, with the bump map. Um, well, that's attractive looking. Anywho. Um, that's such a weird rust texture. Oh, I see. It's my awkwardly UV'd object. Anywho, we're just going to keep going. Um, so now if I go back and I look at my uh, my rust mix, uh, you can see that it is pulling that uh, that texture down here from the the rust where it does have like a little bit of bump and more detail and like the specular roughness and all that stuff down here. Um, so you can make like nice standalone individual textures and then combine them with uh, procedural mapping which is super lovely in my opinion. Um, so is there any questions on what I've gone through so far? All right. Um, save this again. And the last thing that I want to show you guys <coughs> is um, a little bit convoluted, um, but it's basically how to add dust to the top of stuff. Um, so once again, I'm just going to go back to my hypershade, clear all this nonsense out. And mix shader. Let's just call this mix. Or am I doing this? Mix dust. All right. Um, so for the dust, I'm just going to use my uh, my gunmetal texture because it seems like it'll be easier to show up. Uh, I'm going to throw a new texture on here and call it dust, and I'm going to make it very ugly and just sort of generic and light colored. Um, roughness slightly yellowish. All right, that is close enough for the purposes of the demo. Um, 
so for this, um, I'm going to call this dust. Dust. Um, I'm just going to, again, clear this. Um, all right, so where am I looking? Dust. All right. So I have my dust thing here. Um, I put my gunmetal in. I'm going to throw in my dust texture. And then the mix for this is going to be a little bit weird and convoluted. Um, so you want to go for the AI utility node. Um, so again, that's AI utility. And there's like two settings you need to tweak here um, to, to have this show up properly. Um, so shade mode, you're going to want to set to flat. And color mode is going to be normal. Um, basically looking at the normals of the object. Oh, it doesn't respond to me. Yeah, cool. Um, so this is basically uh, what it's looking at. Um, like this is. Uh, you know, if you set this to flat versus normal, um, here's color, here's normal, um, UV coordinates. There's like a bunch of different settings you can use, um, but again, so for this one you want normal, and it's basically just looking at um, anything on the top of the object is going to have this green tint to it. Uh, and you'll notice that uh, on these little coordinates down here on the grid, um, so you have your X, Y, and Z, uh, that the Y is green, so anything facing towards that green is going to have more of a green value. Um, anything facing the red x-axis is going to have more red value, and same thing with z. Closer it is to, or like if it's facing z, it's going to have uh, more blue in it. Um, so that's pretty much if if you ever need to like interpret, you know, what you're looking at here. That's pretty much what it's doing. It's just assigning um, an RGB value to each axis, and then the more parallel it is with that axis, it gets a higher value for that RGB value. Does that make sense? Sort of? Kind of? All right. Um, incidentally, this is actually pretty much how a normal map works. Um, so if you ever open a normal map and are like, wow, why is it you know, these crazy, like weird, trippy colors, like this bluey purple thing? That's pretty much what it is doing there. It's, it's looking at your RGB values um, to define uh, x, y, and z direction here. Um, so yeah. So like again, a little bit different from just like bump map and height map, and actually sometimes normal maps render a little bit faster. Um, sometimes, um, but anywho. So again, this is what you're going to use: AI utility node, set shade mode to flat, and color mode to normal. Um, and then uh, you're going to need to uh, basically do a little bit of tweaking. Um, because you, you want to end up with like a black and white value at the end. Um, so you're going to look for an AI multiply node. And you're going to throw the out color of your AI utility node into input 1. So if you click on your uh, utility node now, you should see um, so input 1 is mapped, input 2 is not. Um, input 2 you're going to want to set to be pure green up here. Just click on this green button. Uh, and if you're ever in doubt, you can go change this little um, hue saturation value, um, change that to RGB, and just make sure that red and blue are both set to zero and green is 255. Um, that ensures that you get pure green. Otherwise, I'm way too lazy to ever check that. This is pure green. Um, so again, throw in your out color utility into input one of your multiply node, and then set the input two to be pure green. Um, and then once you've done that, you're just going to go back in and fiddle with another range node. Um, range. Apparently, I have caps lock on. Um, so I'm just going to throw the um, output color of that into the input of my range. And for this one, so remember, you, when I said it doesn't really matter which uh, value you choose, in this case, it does. Um, so I'm basically what I'm shooting for is a solid layer of dust on top of this object. So like from the y-axis down, like as if dust were falling from the, from the sky. Um, so this time I do specifically want to choose green, since that's the color that's associated with the x-axis on my normal map. So I'll take that and I'll throw that into my mix node. Um, and if I assign this mix dust texture, fully expect this to look odd. Um, so I might need to go through. Um, so like this is pretty much what it's giving me. Um, and usually, wait, that's something cranky there. What are you doing? Um, five seconds. All right. 
So you can see, like, as I play with my range node, um, this one I find to be really fiddly to get set up correctly. Um, but you can see as I play with this, it's going to clamp the green values closer to um, pretty much anything on the very top of the model like this. Um, so if I play, I'm just going to say maybe something like that is halfway decent. Oh, god. Um, that looks amazing. Uh, let me swap my things again. Down that old chicken wire. Cool. Um, so now you can see I have a very awkward gunmetal ball with a very thick layer of dust on top. Um, so that might be where you'd want to go back in and like probably what I did here with the green is a little aggressive. Uh, so I can knock that back and you can see that now it does kind of sort of resemble a thin layer of dust. Um, kind of. For dust it's usually, so like if you want to make your dust look nice, um, you can go in and throw in like a map on your roughness. Uh, I might just throw on a noise texture really quick. Just for grins. Um, nothing like super insanely fancy, but Um, and you can see that just it helps break up the, the surface of the dust texture ever so slightly. Um, dust. Just lighten that up a little bit. Um, but you can see it, it will kind of make that like weird uh, effect as if something's been sort of like, you know, setting directly on top of it. Um, and again, uh, if you're doing this like for realsies, um, refine your textures a little better because this is like a little unnatural here. Um, you, can, you can do a little bit more, I guess, to feather the uh, the range out. So like whatever whatever I did uh, that one. Like down here. Um, and just kinda like play with it until you get something that's like a little bit more realistic. In that case I probably took it down too much. Um, so let's undo that. But um, that's pretty much how you would get something like dust on here. Um, if you happen to want to do so are there any questions on this? Alright. Um, I'm not gonna lie, I feel like procedural texturing, you need to like look at it a little bit differently um, than your standard texturing, but half of the battle with procedural texturing is honestly just like remembering which nodes are which and like which nodes you use, need to use. Cause there's so many of them. Like this is just like really basic, like scratching the surface of procedural texturing. There's like so many more nodes you can do stuff with, which like honestly ha one day I'm gonna go through and just like make myself a like, document of them but um but you can do um, some different stuff here so um for out color like if i um theoretically if i set this to be red um and then i input the the red value into what into my mix um you can see that if i switch the colors to red which is my x-axis it's going to basically like sandblast the side of it with dust um so depending on the direction or whatever that you need um you can use the uh, the values a little bit differently. Um, in this case, I feel like the y-axis probably makes the most sense, but um, does the, the logic behind that kind of make sense? All right, cool. Um, all right, so I'm going to set this back uh, really quick to be uh, green, because uh, I'm going to show you guys how to combine all of this stuff into one, which is going to be, and this is, you'll see in like five seconds why I said it's probably super important to label your stuff, otherwise you'll drive yourself absolutely insane. Um, so basically what I'm going to shoot for for this is, uh, and again, I just like threw my, threw my yellow in there and then it's like pretty much just the dust on the yellow. So again, the powerful thing behind uh, procedural texturing is like I can really easily change all of the material attributes for the base without needing to go into Photoshop and twiddle with, you know, roughness and specular color and like make new maps for everything. I can basically just plug in a new random texture and it's just going to do what I want automatically. Um, it's like great for people who are super lazy and don't like making texture maps, um, which I, for the record, am not saying is a bad thing. I'm totally one of those people. Anywho, um, let me see if I can actually set my project and upload it this time. In case you guys have ever noticed, if Maya crashes, if you, Maya only like remembers your set project if you close out of Maya willingly. If it crashes, it unsets your project, which is the stupidest thing ever. Um, all right, should I do all? What? I'm just gonna click on my books. All right, cool. Um, save this file. All right, better. 
Um, all right, so assuming that I wanted to get something that did kind of resemble like this weird shader ball that I made, um, it's basically just going to be combining all of the things that we just did. So combining these like edge grimies, um, combining the dust and the rust, uh, which is basically just going to be a giant unholy pyramid of mixed nodes attached together aggressively. Um, which, again, gets really complicated. Like the mo like if I expand that, this is the thing just for my dust. And it's just so much. If I had file textures maps here, it would be even more. Um, which is, again, why I very much advise labeling your stuff. Uh, you can also, if you want to, uh, label your noise textures. So it would just be like noise, dust, spec, or noise, dust, roughness. Um, so that way, if you ever happen to be looking at these like in your textures, uh, instead of just having it be like noise one, noise two, uh, it's a little bit more obvious like what stuff actually is. Um, uh, I'm not going to go through and label all these because it's kind of dumb. But um, so if I did want to, you know, create one giant mix node to like end all mix nodes, um, basically what I would want to do is did I no I didn't show okay I'll show you a mini version of this really quick and then. We can use that and like put other stuff onto it. Um, there. Oh my god, where's my code here? Where is my render viewer? What have we done with it? Oh. All right, got rid of my render viewer. I'm gonna use this render view. Um, it is kind of convenient having multiple render views. All right. So here's my scratch texture again. Um, and I'm just going to show you guys like, if you wanted to. So again, this is going to be like a little, like I guess a mini version of, um, don't you dare. Uh, this is going to be like a mini version of what we're about to do more in depth. Um, but if I wanted to do something again, like, so you notice I have like some scratch maps on here apart from the edge. Um, I'll show you guys how to do that really quick. Um, cause I just, that's the thing where I said, I just pulled a default file texture from the interwebs and I just threw it in there and called it a day. Um, so I'm going to shockingly make another mix shader. Um, expand that. Um, I will assign this mix shader here and I will put in my banana texture and my gunmetal texture. Um, pretty much the same way I've been doing. And then for the mix, um, this one is probably like the easiest one. I'm just going to grab uh, a file texture. And I already have my like stupid little scratch texture floating around. Um, so just grab that and throw it in there. And it doesn't seem to be working. So yeah. So once I check alpha is luminance, um, you can see it shows up. I'm gonna go into my um, well, I'm gonna go into my place 2D texture node because this is like horrible and low res and just awful looking, and I'm gonna set this to maybe three. Um, the repeat UMB and that's just gonna tie a little, little bit more. And you can see that the scratches are a little bit nicer looking now, um, so that I can you know kind of go back and use this as I please. Um, so again, if you're ever looking for a kind of cheap and easy way to make a scratched metal texture, you could totally do it like this. Um, Uh, so now what I'm going to do is basically go through and combine. So I still I want these like scratches on the, the main face, but I also want the roughness around the edge here. Uh, so what I'm going to do is start combining mix shaders like an actual crazy person. Um, and so the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to grab uh, this mix shader that I just made with these scratches and grab this mix shader here. And oh wait, actually, that's not what I do. So I'm just gonna okay, sorry. Um, I'm gonna expand the new mix shader that I made, um, and basically going to go in and add another multiply node into this, um, and that is gonna help me to get the scratch texture in there. Um, unless I'm going crazy. Let me actually double check my notes really quick. Doo -doo. Yeah. Ah, okay. Um, yeah. 
So I'm going to take the, here's the multiply from the first set of scratches I did. Um, it does get a little bit like, it can be a lot to keep track of. Um, the deeper, the deeper you get into the uh, world of doing this stuff. But um, and then I'm going to take the, I think this is my scratch texture. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to take my text scratcher, te scratch texture, and drag that down onto the input two of my multiply node, and then just plug that into the uh, the mix of my original scratch. Um, if I flip these up backwards, possibly. Which one's my hand? No, I don't need that. Um, all right. So you kind of like keep expanding stuff, and it's like kind of a good idea again. Label stuff because if you don't, it just it does get really awful. Um, so my theory is that I hooked these up wrong, or I just need to refresh my render view. Um, but basically, you should be able to combine these and uh, sort of apply stuff differently. Except, oh, I forgot about this. Hang on. Give me four seconds. There's like six convoluted ways of doing this, and I do have a giant shader ball set up already. Um, let me just double check what I've done really quick. Um, set scratches. All right. So this is, this is the shader that I set up earlier this morning. Um, oh, I see what I did. I mixed thing into here, and then I went Edge scratches. Oh, oh. Well, that's horrifying. Mix scratches from. Yep. All right. What did I do? All right. Oh. Oh, that's what I did. All right. Um, all right, five seconds, sorry. Uh, let's shift key, jet and bar. Is that your binary file? Or, I don't have that. All right. Change shader from, what? Where did I save this as? file go? Well, that's unfortunate. All right. Apparently, I misplaced the file I was working with. Wait, where did I do that? Um, yeah, what the heck? Alright, that's super weird. My file is just sort of gone, so I'm gonna basically just use one from earlier today. Sorry about that. Um, it has basically all the same stuff set up in it, 